A couple of years ago, some guys from Hopkins looked to see, does your typical doctor know about diabetes testing and management? Guess what? Three quarters of primary care doctors, family practitioners, internists, cardiologists, didn't know how to diagnose prediabetes, let alone manage it. So this is a three-part series which tells you exactly what you need to know about diabetes testing and diagnosis. Take a look. There's a good book by Jenny Rule. I think it's R-U-H-L. One of the chapters talks about what level do we tend to get damage to our arteries? And she does a pretty good job in terms of going back and looking at the science and the evidence. And she would say, once you start spending a lot of time over 140 glucose, you're probably getting damage. Now, she doesn't get into the issue of hyperinsulinemia with no recorded hyperglycemia still causing is damage. But that's what we're doing. We're looking to see, are you going to have too much insulin? Are you going to have too much glucose, especially glucose over 140 for hour after hour at the time? If you do, there's evidence that you're going to be damaging the tissues of your body. So we went a little bit back and forth on this one in terms of getting it ready for today's show. To me, this is the most important slide out of the whole bunch. And basically, it's showing you what Kraft reported in his book. If you're saying, well, I don't think Kraft's book showed a random sample. I don't think it showed true prevalence. It was people that were getting tested. So therefore, maybe that's the problem. Go back and look at others. There are multiple images of glucose metabolism problems by age. And this is the issue. When you're 3 to 13, 14 to 20. And this was like decades ago. That was back in Kraft's age. What was that? 20, 30, 40 years ago when these data were being collected before the current diabetes epidemic, cranking these numbers up even further. This was just age at that time. So you can see if somebody 14 to 20 years old, 13% had problems with their glucose metabolism. 31 to 40, 24%. By the time you're in your 40s, over a third of you have that problem. By the time you're 60, over half of us have damaged carb metabolism into our 70s, two thirds of us. So it's like if you're feeling lucky, you know, it's like the old Clint Eastwood scene, Dirty Harry. I've got several bullets left in my gun or maybe just one bullet. Are you feeling lucky? And I'm not feeling lucky. I think that we all need to know our ability to metabolize carbs because that's the number one thing that's damaging our bodies the number one underlying driver for, quote, normal aging. If you consider normal aging, that you can get into your 60s and have a heart attack unpredicted. Again, as I said before, a lot of people would look at Kraft's book. Joseph Kraft was a pathologist. He ran a large hospital lab in Chicago. And so these people were getting labs because there was suspicion of diabetes. That's why they were getting these. Just Google it. Go to images, prevalence of diabetes by age, or prevalence of insulin resistance by age, or prevalence of prediabetes by age. And just look at the images. The same kind of huge increase as we age. Another place, another way to look at it would be the UCLA study about, what, six years ago, showing that over half of people 30 and above in California had prediabetes or diabetes. And you say, well, gosh, I'm glad I don't live in California. Well, that's not the point either. There was a JAMA study, JAMA Network, which looked at the entire nation of the United States. They saw the same thing. By the time we're age 30, over half of us have a problem with our ability to metabolize carbs. It's incredibly prevalent. It's what this channel is was all about in the beginning, but we've gotten deeper into more prevention programs. We've gotten deeper into providing access through Medicare. So therefore, we've got gotten into more types of primary care. But again, the bottom line is this is what's killing people in the United States. It's what's disabling people in the United States. It used to be just what they called a, a wealth world or a first world problem. Now it's the thing that you see in India, you're seeing it in China, you're seeing it all over the world as we're getting wealthy enough to afford the food that we want to eat and we don't put any barriers on it.
So, anything to add? The world is pushing easier access to unhealthy food. Yeah. And that's evolution. That's part of the revolution. Not every time evolution is a positive thing. It gives a lot of convenience, comfort, but it's basically damaging us. And if you see the statistics on cause of death from when there is a start to have some register of what people died like long time ago. People died at the 30s, 40s, born for infections or trauma. And now we live longer, but we're dying slowly. And that's diet that the way we live has a lot to do with that and genetics has changed as well with the past year the genetics have changed tell me yeah. a little bit more about that there's an article i will i will search that for you but there are some epigenetic components uh, related to the amount of food that we're eating that are making us most susceptible to cardiovascular events. Epigenetics, I, that's why I pushed on that. I thought that might be where you're going. We change our epigenetics dramatically and we've covered that a few times. We haven't covered it recently. There's been a lot of development in epigenetics, especially over the past 20 years. For those of you in the audience that don't understand what epigenetics is, it's if you're in that 60s and if you're a boomer, you may remember a thing called the card catalog in the library. It's basically how you go to find things. That's what epigenetics is in terms of our genetics. The, the genes have not changed significantly, but how we find those genes changes dramatically based on our habits and our environments. So somebody who's been eating carbs six times a day for the past 40 years has a whole different set of proteins set up to uh, metabolize their food. Carbs is a different type of metabolic mechanism. If you get fat adapted, it takes weeks and then sometimes months for some of the adaptations to happen. What's going on there? You're going back and you're changing your epigenetics. You're going back, you're stressing for proteins and enzymes that you have not used that much because you were basically in a different type of metabolism. So yes, genetics have changed, especially if, and your genetics change, especially if you're including epigenetics. This is why all of this matters. And you mentioned that briefly, the insulin actions and components on the vascular tissue. It promotes, it promotes changes in the organ. The more insulin that you have, remember that we mentioned how insulin has a role on storage in lipids. So it does promote that. Those promote inflammation or is related to inflammation. And that is why diabetes is a metabolic and cardiovascular emphasis on vascular disease. And you see here to the right, this is from Dr. Kraft as well. Hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, endothelial dysfunction, which is damage to the vessels and the glycocalyx, vascular pathology, microangiopathy is damage to a small vessels, coronary artery disease, and all the other stuff that comes with that. We have talked about glycocalyx several times. That's the lining. That's the functional area. That's where the rubber meets the road in terms of metabolic changes. We've also shown some photomicrographs where damaged glycocalyx basically just looks like somebody came through with a lawnmower and just cut it down. Remember the root word glyco. So it's a, it's a calyx. It's a hairy substance built off of glucose. 